Michelle Franco is one of the most complete and daring filmmakers at work today. A writer, director, producer, and editor. He's been unafraid of tackling difficult subject matter, from forced underground pornography in his debut feature, Danielle and Anna, which played in director's fortnight at Cannes in 2009, to bullying in After Lucia, which took the top prize in 2012's Cannes Uncertain Regards section. Difficult parent-child relationships and the laying bare of awkward family dynamics tested through difficult situations are at the core of a number of his films, including Through the Eyes, co-directed with his sister Victoria in 2014, April's Daughter, winner of the Uncertain Regard Jury Prize in Cannes in 2017, and Chronic, his English language debut, which won Franco the Best Screenplay Award at Cannes in 2015. His are bold, unflinching works with a singularity of vision that feels dynamic, important, and timely. There's a lean economy to his filmmaking, but it's matched by emotional weight and the construction of complex, nuanced characters marked by a moral ambiguity that seems all too rare in a world where too many are too keen to take sides. This year, his sixth film, New Order, premiered at the Venice Film Festival. It's perhaps less intimate than his previous works, but no less bold. An impressively original work, its narrative centers on the lavish festivities of a society wedding, brutally disrupted by protesters entering the home as a revolution rages on the city streets, with brutal consequences, and, as in his previous films, different perspectives at play. No other film more effectively embodied the unsettled ambience and the polarized extremes of 2020, quite like Michelle Franco's New Order. Michelle, this feels like a, a much bigger film than your earlier five works, a larger cast at the core, a busier handheld camera. Aesthetically, it does feel different to the intimacy that so characterized your previous films. Was this a very deliberate decision on, on your part? Well, thanks, first of all, for that, uh, that very nice introduction you made. Uh, I, I wanted to make a film, uh, a, a film that would study the social dimension uh, on a big scale uh, that analyzes what's going on in a country. Uh, and that's very hard to, to imagine. It's hard to write because you have to put a lot into a certain, you know, a limited amount of pages, but also then once you write it, okay, how are we going to shoot this with, without a Hollywood budget? Um, so it, 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 the reason why it's handheld and why it begins with, with a montage that it, you know, the opening uh, sequence and e every other decision and, and the, I don't know if it's a montage, but the compositions at the, in the middle part of the movie where we show the aftermath uh, uh, with steel compositions. Everything was planned and, and made to serve the script. So it's, it's a bigger movie and less intimate, as you were saying, but not because I was hungry to make an ambitious movie. I, I, I think when filmmakers say, I, 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 I want to grow, I think that's a mistake. I, I think you should simply do what's, you know, the next movie. And, and, and this, I had to do this and, and this was, you know, along with my cinematographer who I have a close relationship with, we figured out this was the, 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 the only way to, to make the movie and it was quite hard. <laughs> Um, you've worked, you, you've just talked about your cinematographer, Eve Cap, and you worked with him previously on April's Daughter and Chronic. And, and April's Daughter, again, was a film that prioritised different points of view. Um, how did you begin collaborating with Cap? Because, of course, he's worked with Bruno Dumont, Claire Denis, Cedric Kahn, Patrice Chéreau. Tell us how you, how you began working with him and, and why you chose him uh, to, to, to work on, on Chronic and, and have remained working with him since then. It's uh, my, my usual cinematographer, Chuy Chavez, who I still want to work with, Mexican, was not available for Chronic. He was busy. So I, 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 shooting Chronic was, was complicated in terms of how do I make sure that it's still going to be a, a film of, you know, my own vision and I'm, I'm going to get away going to Los Angeles to make a movie and still have, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to, 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 to the film to be diluted by, by 
by the I don't know I I just thought uh, uh, what films I like a lot and and Bruno Dumont and Leos Carax and all those and uh, the cinematographer Yves Cap had shot all of the of, the, of, of them and I thought he might bring something new to my cinema as well. So I contacted him. I didn't know him. I started to find out a bit, you know, about how he worked. And, and then we chat on Skype. And, and it, it was a gamble to, to fly him to Los Angeles. And then it was funny because once we started talking about how we were going to shoot, I wanted something different. And he wanted to do what he liked about my movies. He was like, no, this is a Michel Franco movie. So let's not move the camera. Let's, you know, do it like Lucia. Like, and I, it was funny because I told him I, I brought you in for the contrary, for the opposite, you know, I want something new. But that again brings me back to a filmmaker should never say, I want to make an ambitious movie. I want to make a different movie. I think you should understand why you're doing what you're doing and then just shoot it. I mean, and you prioritize um, in uh, New Order different perspectives, uh, which I think is very unsettling for, for, for the viewer. Um, and tell me a little bit, uh, and one of the things that emerges from that is, is a non-idealization of the revolutionaries. Uh, the idea that the that revolution doesn't lead to a better world. Tell us about the negotiation of those different points of view. It, it was only worth making a study uh, uh, on a big scale if it would try to show as many aspects as possible uh, uh, from, from uh, you know, social scale and, and the politician's point of view and the military point of view. And, and, and so I, I decided to do it through uh, a family, a wedding, and the people who work for the family and to try to understand uh, quickly the dynamics between these people but uh, to then see how it breaks uh, throughout the second part of the movie the second half of the movie um, it was a matter also uh, first writing was complicated and I had a much longer script that that dealt with flashbacks and other stuff you know trying to explain uh, a bit more or two and then I decided to trust the audience and 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 the, the film should relate to a worldwide feeling of how wrong we're living uh and how wealth is on uh held by a small percentage and and how inequities everywhere not only in latin america so i said i gotta trust the audience I, I'm, I'm 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 gonna you know this character should symbolize a lot and should, with little time on screen, the actors are gonna have to, to really say a lot with, with little resources. Uh, it was a gamble, I guess, uh, because my other movies are the opposite. You spend a lot of time with each character and some shots are four minutes just there with a the camera in a room. So you, you, you breathe, you live with them. And this is always shifting from a character to the next. Uh, I'm skipping from one subject matter to the other. I, I don't even know what you asked at the beginning. Um, uh, it was about your, your different points of view, which I think your answer has captured incredibly well, the ways in which this film really does uh, bring them to the fore. Um, did you shoot it in chronological order? Because with your previous films, you've largely shot in chronological order and you often reshoot scenes. I remember uh, uh, once you, you telling me that with Chronic, you'd reshot 30% of the scenes for the, for the film. It, it was the same in this case. Uh, I developed this system and, and I, it's so far working for me, so I, don't, I, I wouldn't give it up. Like, for example, if I shoot another film in the States, Chronic, I, I produced Chronic with Gabriel Ripsing, so we were able to do that. Uh, but if I ever shoot another film in the States, it has to be, or any other place, it has to be done in the same way. Uh, I like the possibility of reshooting and I like shooting chronologically. When we shot April Zotter, the owner of the equipment, the film equipment, you know, the big trucks, were, was very uh, uh, not happy with me sending back and forth the trucks. Uh, and he said, why don't you just shoot it? You know, like movies are done. And I said, Be because I don't know, I didn't go to film school. I, I, I don't know how to shoot that way. I, I like going chronologically. I have the editor on set. Uh, 
So we're reshooting everything that it's, it's not because we got it wrong. It's because we realized it could be better or more interesting. Uh, so the lunch break every day I spend it with the editor. And since it's chronological, we can see, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes. It's, it, you start to discover the film. Of course, that later will change. This Nuevo Orden was a year of editing. So whatever we finished uh, on set changed, of course, uh, throughout a year of, of hard work. And how finished was the film before COVID hit? I mean, did it delay completion? Uh, what was the impact of, 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 of COVID on, uh, on the film? On uh, it, 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 it helped the movie in terms of, I, I thought the editing was done and I was ready to, to you know, rush into post-production. The BFX were, uh, had been the, uh, working for months uh, of, uh, several months in Paris uh, because my cinematographer is based in Paris so he was pretty much in charge of, of all that uh, technical and, and creative aspect of the movie uh, so it gave more time to the visual effects but mainly it, it, it was important that I kept editing my sister who you mentioned I co-directed a movie with her she's my uh, uh, my the, the one who understands better what I want to do and how my movies can be improved. And we, the, the editor and I, we were sure that we were done. And, and she said, you, you got it wrong in many parts because it's over edited. You, 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 you're thinking too much and you gotta go back and edit from the gut. And she was right. So COVID helped in that way. And, and, and there was a lockdown in Mexico, but I never stopped working because the editor and I could, you know, just two people in a room. So that was, that was good. I, I'm, I'm glad we went to Venice and, and the film arrived to, uh, to its final form. Yeah. I mean, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Romney, when he saw the film in, in, in Venice, described it as having the dystopian lucidity of J. Uh, G. Ballard and the icy rigor of Michael Haneke. I mean, it's not the first time your work has been compared to Michael Haneke. Yeah, and uh, of course I'm always flattered because he's a fantastic filmmaker. He's a, I think he's, uh, I like him and Lars von Trier and many other directors, but the, those two to me are giants of our times. I like Nurit Bilge Jailan and I like uh, Pedro Costa and I like uh, but but my cinema might be closer uh, somehow. So then again, it, it's my sixth, sixth movie, and I I could understand how my previous work was was compared to to Haneke, but, but I don't think No Order is similar to any movie altogether. And and I like that. I'm proud about that. And I'm Eve and I, my production designer, we're not working from. Uh, uh, references or th this was really a gamble and we really didn't know what we were doing so to speak I'd, I mean I think one of for me one of the strengths is the f of the film is is a characteristic of all your filmmaking which is the way in which you show but you don't tell uh, and by that I mean the wedding scene is for me a, a wonderful lesson in how you're able to portray the whole culture of bribes and corruption in, uh, in, in, in those upper echelons of Mexican society, just by stuff that is absolutely normal, that they think that the wedding is a space to be doing those deals. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful way of, of showing how, uh, how corruption underpins the whole society. But I think that's a characteristic of all your work, the showing rather than the telling. The, the, the corruption and, and the way these people behave and the way classism and racism and, and every other thing that, that it, I wanted to shoot it, uh, like almost taking it for granted, like, like as if it's a natural thing, because in Mexico it's the daily bread. So we don't even see how wrong it is that we're living. But again, not only in Mexico, it's not a coincidence that Parasites and Joker came out. I had already finished my movie and, and those came out. It, it's, I think everybody understands these things. So with small gestures and trusting the audience, you can, uh, you can achieve a lot, uh, and, and that, that's why I hate uh, this, this uh, TV series bullshit that is entirely anti-cinematic, uh, because 
when people explain you why series are great, they tell you because you have a lot of time to understand the characters. And that's bullshit. Cinema is about saying a lot with, 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 without words or with little resources. And, you know, I, 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 that, that, I want to keep working that way. And it doesn't mean I wouldn't do TV one day or whatever, but, but it, it's, it's beautiful to try to, to say a lot with, with little and to trust the audience. I mean, I remember uh, years ago when we were talking about um, After Lucia, you, you, you mentioned, I never try and explain everything in my films. And again, I think that's a characteristic that runs through all your filmmaking, that you let mystery remain. There are things we will never know as a viewer. And I think your films are all the richer for it. I, and, and, and again, uh, how much damage Save the Cat and all those silly books have made to cinema. And the fact that every filmmaker, not every filmmaker, of course, but uh, most filmmakers from most countries are trying to, to be Hollywood, trying to, and the rules are within the first five minutes of the movie, everything has to be clear. Who's good, who's bad, what are the goals? Jesus, let's not even, you know, waste people time if, if it's gonna be like that. <laughs> Tell me about where you start with a film when you're because you're obviously you're an incredibly accomplished screenwriter and you take responsibility for the screenplays of, of, of your film. Do you begin with a theme? Do you begin with a character? You often write with particular actors in mind. Mm, uh, well, every movie is a bit different. Most of my movies begin from birth, from personal experiences, which doesn't mean they are uh, biographical. Uh, it just means that there's a feeling or our interest, an obsession, a fear uh, that I that I need to explore, and and I write a movie about that. Uh, New Order was different. New Order, New Order is also personal because living. I since I was a kid, I I, I knew it was wrong. The way we're living is wrong, and when you're a you know, six-year-old, you, you ask, but why? Why are people uh, without the basic things that we enjoy? And, and you, you know, why are we living a privileged life? And, and, and you drive 10 minutes within the city and you are suddenly in a place that is clearly not, you know, things are not right for, for these people. And growing up apparently means... Uh, that's the way it is. Nothing can be changed. Uh, yeah, it's sad, but come on, enjoy life. That, that's, that's what you keep hearing, you know, what I kept hearing when I was growing up. And I think that it's the same everywhere. This is the same everywhere. And Africa, for example, a whole continent completely forgotten, you know. The world simply won, you know, let's just forget Africa exists. That's the solution people offer. And it's heartbreaking. In this way, Norther is, of course, very personal too. Uh, and, and, and I belong to that privileged uh, Mexican society, clearly. And I wanted to, to portray that uh, and, and how, how it's wrong in so many levels. I wanted to portray that in a movie. Tell me about, let's move to the beginning of your, your filmmaking career and, and your first uh, feature, uh, Daniel and, and, and Anna, where I think we see the signature style of your first uh, four films, the, the static observational camera, the sparse dialogue, a, a real, I, for me, a cinema of, of, of austerity, only diegetic music. Um, were you really clear when you were conceiving that film that that, that was the... The, the the aesthetic, the style that you wanted to to go with to to tell that story. Uh, it it all began. My last short film from two thousand and three was handheld, and and you know I, that was my last cinematic experience. And five years later, I had to shoot the script I wrote for Daniel and Anna, and I didn't know how to shoot it, but I did know that I what I did what what I wanted to avoid, and I was. Growing up in Mexico, melodrama is a big thing, uh, not only in TV, but also in, in movies. And I knew I didn't want it to go there. So I said, I, I thought with my cinematographer, if we keep the camera away and we're not using film language in the uh, classical way, 
and we're not, you know, cutting to the close up and explaining everything. And if if we're not uh, using music to uh, everything that wasn't achieved by the actors or or the camera, you know, just explain it with the music. Every, every I I just thought I'm I'm gonna make my first movie and I want it to outstand. I I I want to gamble and if it's a terrible movie, you know. I'll leave with that, but I don't want to make a mediocre movie because how many first time directors are working every year and somehow you gotta, uh, it's hard to make a movie. And I shot that in 35 millimeters and it's always expensive. So you gotta use that to make something strong, not just another movie. And again, I was already obsessed. I, my, my favorite uh, film book is uh, Bresson's notes on, on uh, cinematography or whatever it's called in English. And, um, he insists about you know how tricks shouldn't be used and how uh, how you can find something truthful in cinema if you don't go to the obvious places and and I think I was somehow trying to do that with Daniel and Anna. Tell me about the story for Daniel and Anna because it's based on uh, on on a thing uh, on events that happen with these forced kidnappings in in Mexico. So tell me about the, the point of origin for the film. It's an incredibly disturbing um, uh, tale in, in many ways of a brother yeah. and sister that are forced to have sex together when they're kidnapped. I, it, it, the, the story came to me, arrived to me through the therapist that, that uh, treated the, the real case. And uh, the, the, the person who, the, the brothers, the siblings that went through this experience, wanted the their story to be portrayed because somehow it would be cathartic. I never met them, but it it was through the through the therapist. Uh to me it was a good mix of an intimate story, uh a portrayal of characters that I I know well because it's again uh Mexicans that live in a certain way. And I like the family dynamics on on, on the story because uh things will not be talked through and even though characters love each other everything gets more complicated uh, and of course it talks about violence in mexico which uh, i insist it's our daily bread so that's why i thought that was going to be my my first movie and 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 i knew it had a certain power because first they're forced to have sex but that's not the climax of the movie the the the, the point of interest is how what they do with that you know, afterwards and i think that's one of the one one of the strengths of the film is the way you deal with the consequences of that act on the siblings and how they have to renegotiate their relationship i love the width that you uh that you use in terms of the screen which for me accentuates the isolation of the characters the gulf between them i didn't know what i was doing uh i was working from my instinct and then i was surprised when i wrote después de lucia about how similar the the, the scripts the, there are very different movies but again people were not communicating communicating with each other and and it, those two movies uh, work in a very simple way if they could simply talk to each other the characters this everything could be avoided but that's how we live uh, every, you, you know, we're supposed to be clever, educated people, sophisticated, and we keep not being able to talk with our children, with our partners. Uh, and I'm fascinated by this lack of capacity to, to simply, you know, <laughs> live uh, and express ourselves. And I think cinema is, uh, the screen's a good uh, medium to, to to explore this without having to explain it. You've just mentioned Después de Lucia, After Lucia, and this was your, uh, your first feature as producer. What made you turn to becoming a producer on your films? And what's that given you? Uh, uh, freedom, I presume, but, but, but tell us. Control, it, freedom? It, 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 yes, uh, control and freedom, absolutely. But, but it, it was quite simple. The, my, my first movie was a great, experience with the actors and with the cinematographer and with the editor who I we didn't edit three movies in between but now we're working together again but 
every other aspect from from the movie was 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 a horrible experience was extremely complicated uh we had a huge crew so uh, money was being wasted on on things that were not on screen uh i wasn't allowed to shoot chronologically i just what i just said i wasn't allowed i had to keep asking for permission and excusing myself and and explaining to someone else and i think the film works daniel and anna i'm proud of it and and it's a a, a decent debut movie but i knew that if i kept doing movies that way i i wouldn't go far and 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 it was painful it was painful a horrible experience and people kept the crew I, the crew was good like the people that were close to me were were good but but the bigger scale was terrible so anyhow i realized uh even with a smaller budget uh, i i i rather rely on my own you know uh, i rather blame myself if things are not working than than having to be on the phone with someone i don't like asking for permission and, and <laughs> well i I'm, i'm repeating myself but but that's i that's why i became my own producer and 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 después de lucia we shot it with a tiny tiny budget but nevertheless we shot nine weeks i reshot this system of reshooting i i i developed it there uh well actually i developed it with a los ojos co-directing with my sister that movie uh that's what that that's where i really learned how to make my movies uh, in in a lot through the eyes a los ojos but but it was a year and a half of shooting through the eyes because it's half documentary half so so it's different uh después de lucia was a regular shooting only done with little money but still i reshot everything i want i did everything i wanted so i learned that and it's my most successful film i mean probably new order will 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 Uh, be more explosive than that is proving to be more 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 than lucia but uh it even turned into a commercial movie so to speak because in mexico it sold a million entries so i shot a movie with a tiny budget we shot it with a 7d camera that you know photo camera and nobody cared about the technical aspects people were just moved by the what was portrayed on screen so i after that i under after that i even started producing movies for other directors because it became I, it's cinema works that way i it 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 went from nobody believing in me and and nobody listening to me and having to work with tiny budget to a lot of trust and to a, a lot more attention so that was very satisfying i'm going to return to your work as as a producer later but tell me about um i mean you've talked about the success of 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 after lucia For me, the performances are just extraordinary. Uh, uh, Tessa Ia as, as Alejandra uh, and Hernan Mendoza as, as Roberto, her, her father. Uh, rarely have I seen such a fam- fabulous portrait of grief. His grief numbs him. And there's something about what he can't articulate, what he can't say. So tell me a little bit about the casting because I think they're both extraordinary in the film. It, it was, I, I, I agree with you. I think they're great. Uh, it was pretty much the first movie of both of of, of them uh hernan is uh now he's after that movie he he became a, a film actor but before that he worked uh on stage he was one of the most respected on uh, stage uh, actors but i don't know if because of his physics or he he worked on tv too you know just to make a living but like in soap operas in telenovelas and uh somebody uh, uh the the actress mother told me because again the film the, the part was rejected by important mexican actors so she told me you should see this guy on stage so we went to see him and i was fascinated and i just gave him the role in media that i gave him the script and said if you want the role it's yours there's no need for casting or anything uh and the first few days of shooting uh he came from stage so it was hard I, i i told him you're gonna hate me because i keep saying don't do this don't do that like restraining him but at the same time telling him you gotta trust the camera and i the, the, you you all those emotions will you know trust yourself and trust so, and he was not annoyed the opposite he liked the amount of attention that i was 
uh, giving to every small detail. Uh, and Tim Rudd, when he saw the movie and, and gave us the award in, um, in Cannes, the first thing he asked is, who's that man? Like, who's that actor? Because he thought, you know, he, he's like a star or something. Not a star, you know, like a huge, he, he must be a huge actor in Mexico. He was totally unknown. And for Tess, I wrote the part. She's the sister of Nayan, of the uh, lead of New Order, their, their sisters. So again, I know Tessa since she was very young. And I wrote the part specifically for her. And, and I kept asking questions about would teenagers do this or not? How do you talk to your friends? All the uh, bullies, uh, everyone that's bullying her on the movie, they're her real friends in life. Uh, so a lot of improvisation, a lot of uh, playing around with, with real feelings. And that, I think that's why it works. I think that's another uh, wonderful part of the film is the way you portray that teenage world where the adult presence is minimal. Uh, they police themselves, they're, they're in a little bubble. And, uh, and that, I mean, that works beautifully. It's wonderfully nuanced in the film. Uh, and, and you, you know, what it leads to it, it, in this case is almost a Lord of, well, a, a Lord of the Flies situation. Yeah, yeah. People mentioned that movie too, which, which you know, I'm, I'm flattered about. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to make a study uh, uh, about mar martyrdom, you say it that way? What would the girl do to, in her mind, help the depressed father? Uh, and of course, she makes a lot of mistakes. Uh, and that took me to wanting to make a study of teenagers, the way they relate. Um, because something I wasn't entirely satisfied with Daniel and Anna was, I think it's a little, I, I could have gone deeper into, into the teenage world. So in Daniel and in Después de Lucia, I, I, I was determined to go, you know, really into it. Uh, so it should, I think it works as a study of, of these dynamics. Uh, people tend to think, to describe it as a film about bullying, but bullying only begins uh, like uh, halfway through into the movie. It's, again, it should be about many things, about grief mainly and about, the lack of communication, but it should really be a study of teenagers too. And, and I, 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 I like what the kids did in, on, on screen. How do you work with, with actors, Michelle? Because you, you were talking about the importance of uh, A Los Ojos Through the Eyes, which you, you worked with with your sister, uh, Victoria. And that film, like New Order, features Monica del Carmen, who was an actress who also was prim primarily known as a stage actress before you cast her in um, uh, uh, Through the Eyes. So tell me about how you work with actors, because again, hers is a terrific performance. Um, and again, you have, you have children in, in that film, slightly younger, you know, on the cusp of, of the teenage years, moving into the teenage years. Tell me about that film. I, I, I Monica del Carmen, I saw her in, on Leap Year, and she's the actress that's in most of my movies. She's in New Order too, of course. Uh, so she's my favorite actor, so to speak. I keep going back to her. Even when she's not on screen, she's helping me to find non-actors. I like mixing actors and non-actors, but the way I, I, I work with actors, uh, it's very straightforward. Uh, I don't believe in this manipulating, manipulation, uh, or, or some, some uh, you know, some, some directors, uh, tend to, to say, uh, I'm going to break this actor. I'm going to take him where he's not comfortable and then I'm going to do... I, I don't believe in those things. I, I like, you know, to be... I, first, if there's a good script, that, that uh, it's a good point of departure. But then I like to, to talk with them and listen to them and, and be respectful. And it's the same directing a five-year-old kid than a, you know, very accomplished actor then of course they have to be humble as well it, it's it's and we need to be able to lose to to get lost within the process and to find again i i'm a director that's never afraid to say on set uh this is not working this is poorly written i'm not satisfied i don't know how to do it uh so i'm not pretending to know everything uh and i of course i believe it's a matter of uh, film is a 
collective effort. Uh, so with actors, I'm very straightforward. Uh, and I don't direct in a different way, uh, for example, a complicated sexual scene or a uh, it's tricky because then people think that the, the, the smaller scenes, ah, those are easy to shoot. And sometimes those are a lot more complicated. So every scene is treated with the same amount of uh, concentration. Of course, you know, if I'm shooting a sex scene, I'm careful to have uh, the, a close environment and all that. Um, and actors trust me to, to, to a great extent. Uh, for example, in New Order, uh, the opening scene where, where Nayan is covered in green paint and she's naked on pretty much on the street. That was not on the script. Not the fact that she was naked. And talking with the cinematographer, we said, that would be fantastic, but will she agree? It took three minutes for her to say, if you think we need it, then go ahead. So it's all about trust. It's all, and, and they need to open themselves up. Uh, and I like working with the same actors time and again. Whenever I'm asked, who do you want to work with? I just want to go back to, 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 to my actors. And of course, to discover new ones. But, but I, I, like, I like the fact that it's a family. And how, what role does improvisation play in terms of, of, of you know, you bring a, a screenplay. Was the screenplay very different for something like uh, uh, Through the Eyes, where you're working with your sister, to something like um, uh, Chronic, for example? Tell us about the differences uh, between, uh, you know, do you have different, or, or is it a, a similar, do you, do you still leave a degree of freedom for the development of the screenplay through, through the filming process? Through the Eyes was done with, uh, uh... Uh, treatment, a three-page treatment. There was no script because the whole idea of that movie is not imposing to homeless people in Mexico City, of course, just to understand how they live. Again, to make a study of, of homeless people through the look of Monica del Carmen's character, who's a social worker. So Monica was committed uh, to the role, to the job uh, without being paid because we did that movie, you know, with, with nothing really with nothing she became a real social worker and my sister and monica went six months to the streets to start you know so people would get used to them uh they were spending eight ten hours uh, first only talking then recording i don't have that kind of patience i i, I think i will never do a documentary myself but once my sister had done all all, all that hard work and recorded uh, uh, a huge amount of material. I shaped the fictional part of it uh, with Benjamin, the, the lead act, who's not an actor. He, he, he was homeless when we met. And we the whole process of rehab that he went through, that he goes through in the story, he went through for real. Mm -hmm. The whole detox process. And, and it was all done with Casa Alianza, which is an institution that works, has been around for, I don't know, 30, 40 years helping out homeless people. Uh, so it, 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 it's, I think it's my spe most special movie. It, it's a shame that it's the one that people have seen less, uh, but I took to an extreme the, the everything has to be real. Uh, and I, 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 I'm very fond of that movie uh, it, it, because of my poor decisions on letting it go and, and accepting certain invitations and not others. I take the blame on, on the fact that it's not, uh, uh, it didn't uh, receive a wider release, but I think people will find it uh, throughout time. I, I was always hoping to have a more successful movie, which now might be in order, because then people will also probably look back into my other movies, and, and that would be great, because every movie has been, especially that one, such a hard task. And you talked about learning a lot about filmmaking when making that film. What was the relationship with your sister like when you were filming? Did you take a different role? How did you negotiate the co-direction? Or was it that she took responsibility for the more documentary aspects and you for the, for, for the, the work with the actors in developing the narrative? It was like that, but having said that, of course you would speak her mind every time something wasn't working. Uh, she, Monica and, and Victoria, my sister, are very, very close. I, I think we did everything together. Uh, although she did the documentary part on her own, but the rest we did together. Uh, 
I, I was a little bit more experienced, so I, I, I knew a little bit better how to frame a scene and try to make what I did later in Lucia and Chronic uh, to work with the actors within the frame and the composition and all that. But I, still my sister is uncredited on, 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 on my, and, and no other she's credited as, as, as casting director along with Viridiana. That's not accurate exactly. She kept on bringing, because New Order is such a, uh, the cast is huge, we needed, and, and my sister was obsessed about every actor or non-actor should be right for every smaller part. Otherwise this won't work. So even in the warehouse, uh, every kidnapped character uh, was carefully um, picked, uh, picked by my sister. So. She, I wouldn't know how to describe in a conventional way the way we work together. Uh, and I produce short films for her and she's now writing her first feature and I want to produce that, of course. Let's move on to Chronic. Um, I think for me, one of the things I find so uh, extraordinary about Chronic is uh, the performance of, of Tim Roth, um, but also his singular sense of purpose. And I think that's something he's got in, he shares in common with Monica in, in in through her through her eyes i mean they're they're driven by a very particular thing that isn't always clearly articulated and that we find out about much later in the film tell me about making chronic because obviously it was a project that you were thinking about and then took a very different direction when you met tim roth uh, in Cannes. it it, it I, I wrote chronic because uh the caregiver that that was with my grandmother after she suffered a brain stroke uh, and took care of her for six months. You know, I, I was fascinated by her and the relationship, so I wrote Chronic. When I met Tim, I told him, he asked, what's the next movie? I said, it's a nurse, a female character in Mexico, and she's, uh, you know, I told him the whole story. He said, turn it into a man and I'll do it, which I never, to, for me, it was, uh, like you said, very close to Through the Eyes. Uh, Through the Eyes is a social worker. This was a caregiver. And it was supposed to be, you know, an intimate, smaller movie in Mexico. But Tim went nuts about Lucia and he really wanted to work with me. And of course, you know, I, I got excited about the idea because I, I love his work. Uh, and I, I realized from a male perspective, the story could be even more interesting because it's not the obvious take. So I rewrote the script for Tim and we had long chats about it and he, he had, a lot to say about the script so m many pages were perfect but it, some other things he said i would like this and that and his his instinct was right so we collaborated in a very in a great way um that script was crafted we, we there was no improvisation at all or very little the only improvisation was when tim tim worked as a as a caregiver like Monica did as a social worker for several months he went through the experience so often he was able to explain uh, to me the technical aspect of a caregiver or certain ideas and so the cinematographer and I we knew exactly what how we wanted to place the camera and how to shoot but Tim was very much in charge of his character and there are some stories about how much I directed him, you know, uh, very punctually, but in many, many scenes, he was just, you know, doing what he thought was best and it worked. I don't like directing actors that much. I like hiring actors and letting them, them do their thing. And if we need to work together, we will, but, but I respect actors and I want to see what they propose before I impose my, my vision. It was a great experience with, with Tim. Tim would always be sitting at the entrance of the location, each house we were shooting on. And I was, like, he would arrive before I, you know, he would arrive earlier to his call. And I was like, Jesus, Tim's sitting there again. I, you know, I, I, I need a lot to figure out. It's not just his character. And Tim would be like, no, let's sit down. We need to talk about what we're shooting. We need to talk. We need... And I, I thank him for that because I didn't, get lost in any technical aspect of the movie. I was close to Tim and we really made the film together. And my cinematographer was taking care of the other aspects uh, 
So I rely heavily on people, as you can see. I, 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 I don't pretend to know everything. I hate that approach on cinema. But I think, you know, one of the things for me, again, that, that, that I see lots of similarities between Chronic and Through Her Eyes is that uh, they're both films that are unafraid to ask questions of the moral choices the characters make and the consequences of the situations that they find themselves in. And that makes the complex, interesting cinema. With the, yes. Uh, in life, it's always clear what's right and wrong, but then... <laughs> Uh, when fiction is treated uh, in a simple way, it's not interesting. And I, li I like the gray area. I like facing the audience with, with what would you do in that situation? Um, for example, when, when Tim's character in Chronic uh, helps Marta uh, uh, to, to be, because she wants to end her life because she's a terminally ill patient, uh, he knows it's... He, <laughs> He agrees with her and he wants to help her, but that doesn't mean it's not painful and it triggers, uh, it brings back his personal uh, traumatic experiences. So, so, and, but I don't want to explain it. I, I want the audience to go through it with, with him. Um, and in Through the Eyes, it's even worse because the character has to do, to betray the, the she, she's a social worker and she, she's supposed to help people but when her own, own child needs a, 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 needs a, a solution so he won't lose his sight she makes something terribly wrong but what would people do you know honestly what would people do i i i like facing facing people and facing myself with the ultimate uh difficult decisions that uh, one eventually will have to make uh, in life. When I saw Chronic, it um, it made me think about Ingmar Bergman, and I do think <laughs> it's um, it's a film for me that really crystallised the relationship I think your cinema has to Bergman's cinema. You also mentioned Bresson, and again, I think there's something in the leanness of of your work that reminds me of Bresson. Have both of those been formative influences on you? Well, I, I'm, I'm, thanks for saying that, but of course I, I would put myself uh, a million uh, miles away from, from those masters. Uh, but yeah, to me, Bergman and, and Bresson are two of the, the best, absolutely. And I like Buñuel a lot too, but I don't think my filmmaking has a lot to do with Buñuel, unfortunately. Oh, maybe but New Ber Order. Maybe New Order. If maybe New Order, yeah, yeah. Buñuelian film, I think, is New Order. It's been said a bit, it's true, uh, in, with Viridian and uh, this great charm, maybe, maybe. I, 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 I don't take myself too seriously. I, I think the, the, the minute a filmmaker uh, believes, you know, if I think I'm, 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 I'm great and if I assume that I know what I'm doing, I think that then I'm lost immediately. And uh, I, for, I thought about New Order for six years. Chronic was a long process too. Chronic, I, I, my grandmother passed in 2010 and I finally shot it in 2014. Uh, and I made uh, Through the Eyes and Después de Lucía in between. So I was really into others. But I think once it's time to, to, to okay, I'll go get into the next movie. I have to dive into it. And I don't think about my previous work. I don't think about references. Uh, but I've seen not every Bergman movie, but uh, almost all of them a few times. And, and I'm obsessed with Bergman. I think the insight he, he had about human behavior and the human soul, but at the same time being deeply cinematic, uh, simple and profound. I mean, he's the ultimate master, of course, uh, Bergman. So how did you, I mean, you talked about not going to film school, but you made a number of shorts, you made commercials. Is that how you honed your craft? Um, you talked about the importance of reading Bresson's work. Um, are you a filmmaker that in effect learnt your craft by doing? Um, I, I don't believe in film school anyhow. I, that doesn't mean film, calls, film, film schools shouldn't exist because it, they, they work uh, for, for some people. I, 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 I would have liked to go to film school when I was younger, but but I, when I shot my first film, eight movies were done per year in Mexico. 
So my father was very concerned about, you know, the obvious, how will you make a living? So advertisements seem to be the solution to not be too far from what I really wanted to do. Of course, I hated <laughs> advertisement. It, it, I mean, by watching my movies, you can, uh, there's no further, uh, but that was good too, because I was so fed up of, of, of six, seven years of doing commercial stuff that I said, okay, finally I, I get to do my own stuff. So I took it as far uh, further from, from commercial world as I could uh, in terms of the grammatics of uh, cinema and, and so on. Um, but I think nobody can teach you to be a director and especially to be a writer. I, I think if you're truly obsessed with, with, with film and if it's your only, it, film becomes a way of living. Uh, for me, uh, I don't know if, if if it sounds depressing or interesting. It depends on how much you un understand uh, these obsessions. But every, you know, for example, I was kidnapped once in Mexico. I express kidnap, they call it. So I was held for seven hours going to ATMs. It's a fun story if I would tell you the details, and it's a horror at the same time. I was 21. I was already making short films, and. First, of course, I panicked and I, because I thought I was gonna die. And the only way to, to, to calm myself and to not lose my mind was pay attention to every detail, listen. Uh, they wouldn't let me see, but you know, try to remember everything that's happening because you will use this for your writing someday. Even if it's not a, again, I'm, I'm not working on a autobiographical. I didn't shot a movie about that. But maybe for Daniel and Anne it helped, and maybe for New Order it helped. So every, you know, living for me is always material for 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 work. And I, but but I think that's a, the 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 way writers work too. Like like you know, novelists. Uh, Philip Roth is one of my favorite writers. Everything has to do with with his world and himself and and. Uh, I think that's the difference between uh, serious filmmaking and just bullshit, uh, non-important <laughs> filmmaking. I'm not saying mine is important. I'm just saying the right approach. I, sometimes I, I talk to, 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 to big uh, directors, friends of mine who are accomplished Hollywood, big directors with huge houses in Los Angeles and so on. And they tell me, uh, you know, they complain about how they're not, they don't have full freedom to work. And they tell me, wouldn't you like to make at least one masterpiece? I, when will I make my bicycle thief? They, they ask, you know, and I said, you never, man, because you're making movies that are 60 or a hundred million dollars with, with, you know, <clears throat> of course that's not gonna happen. But if, if you take film as a personal thing, and that that's i'll just finish by saying nobody can teach you that after chronic were you not tempted to make more work in english because your your film after chronic uh, uh april's daughter uh was shot you went back to mexico and and you made it in mexico did you ever think about it as an english language potentially as an english language film i i did i did but i i i hate meetings and pitching and 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 I, I, I was not, you know, and I still don't want to go through that ever if I can avoid it. And Los Angeles, it's all about meetings and meetings and meetings. And you, you feel that you accomplish something by, I had a great meeting. So I'm not into that. I, 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 and, and in Mexico, I can control things a lot more. There are certain actors that I really want to work with in the States or British actors. Uh, and I will, I'm sure. But it has to be on my terms. It has, I have to be in control. Uh, and, and so whenever that opportunity comes again, Chronic was all done with Mexican money and Gabriel Ripse and I were the producers. So yeah, why not shoot again in Los Angeles? Having said all this and going back to the uh, directors I admire the most, they made the best work in their own countries. Uh, Kislovsky went to France and still made fantastic movies. Of course, you can do it. You can pull it off. And of course, many uh, uh, European directors uh, went to the States to, to do some of, you know, fine work. And 
Mexican directors, but it's already hard to write something good in my own country after, uh, when I'm asked what was the research for New Order, just living there 41 years. So that's already hard. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to be a foreigner and on top of that, try to do something truthful. Uh, with, um, uh, with April's daughter, you cast Emma Suarez uh, as, uh, as the mother, as April. Um, were you always, uh, did you always want an outsider to play that role? Because there's something about her as an outsider in, in the film that I think works really well in, in terms of the feminine dynamic created between uh, the mother and the, and the daughters that you take in very unsettling different directions through the film. No, I think, I think uh, Emma Suarez did a fantastic job. I, 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 I had seen her movies, but when the idea came to my head was after watching Julieta. But, but the real story, it, it's, it's very silly. I, I went to a Mexican actress, uh, slightly older, uh, that hasn't done great work in a long time, but was good uh, before. And I thought, I'll give her the role and it's going to be a comeback for her. And it was funny. She read the script and, and she thought it was terrible and she wasn't interested. And I, I, I think there's still a thing sometimes uh, when, when a director, uh, I, since I didn't go to film school and so on, I think, strangely enough, I still, some people didn't want to, to believe, I don't know, whatever. So I was angry and I said, who's the best actress in the whole world? Spanish speaking. I don't mind if I bring someone from Argentina or from and uh, Emma Suarez from Julieta. I thought if she was good enough for Almodovar and with the Emma was the opposite. She read the script six hours, you know, I send her and six hours later she was uh, telling me how great it was and, and, and signing in for the role. Um, and I'm grateful w uh, to her because she was very humble. She, she She's a fantastic actress, and we remain close friends. And Valeria, Ana Valeria, the, one of the daughters, uh, the, the main uh, actress in the movie, it was her first movie, uh, 19 years old. And uh, Joanna Larecki, the, the other daughter, also, you know, she's not like a star in Mexico. She's a fantastic stage actress. And they became a family. I, I don't rehearse, we just read the script, but a, a week before shooting, I put them in the house where, where we shot mo most of the movie in Puerto Vallarta. And without any production assistance or anything, they just lived there. We gave them the car that was gonna be used throughout the movie. So, you know, they went out and buy groceries and they got drunk together and they, they became a family. So when I, when I went back a, a week later to, to shoot, they would, sometimes improvise some dialogue or and uh, cut uh, that was good but just out, out of curiosity why did you say that oh you don't know but our characters lived you know six years ago this happened to us okay fantastic <laughs> i think the film um i mean i love the ending to the film as well but i always think your films take the viewer in an extraordinary direction at the end of the film. You often surprise us, you unnerve us, you unsettle us at the end of the film with, with the decisions that your characters make, knowingly or unknowingly. Um, and that's the case in After Lucia, it's the case in April's Daughter, it's the case in Chronic, uh, and it's the case in New Order as well. Well, endings are important. Uh, um, because that's what, what the, the audience walks away with, uh, I mean, the whole film, but the, the ending has to make an impact. That doesn't mean it has to be fireworks. I often do fireworks, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I like knowing what the ending of a movie is w when I'm writing, not necessarily at the beginning of the process, but early, early on the process, because that's what gives meaning to the whole movie. Uh, so yes, people talk a lot about the ending of, of, of Lucia, uh, for example. The end of April's daughter is a bit different, right? Because uh, there's, to me, there's hope at the end. The, the, the daughter, you know, she, she I, I won't spoil it if someone hasn't seen it, but there's hope at the end of April's daughter. 
We've come to the end of the interview, but before we finish, I'd like to just ask you two very brief things. You've talked about Gabrielle Ripstein, uh, and, and obviously he was involved in Chronic, uh, translating uh, the, the screenplay for you in English, and you produced his film, um, uh, 600 Miles. You've also produced Lorenzo Vigas' From Afar, uh, uh, a, golden, uh, a Golden Lion winner in, in Venice. Um, uh, the same year as Ripstein uh, uh, premiered 600 Miles in um, Berlin. And last year, of course, we had David Zonana's Workforce that we screened here at the London Film Festival. So your work as a, as a producer, tell us a little bit about the importance of that to you. And finally, what's next for you, Michelle, in terms of After New Order? It's this, this we're a group of friends. Uh, we've been talking about cinema for 20 years, Gabriel, Lorenzo Vigas and I. Uh, so it's not like I'm the producer at all. Uh, they, they knew a lot more about cinema when we met because I was much younger. I was just more radical and more, you know, hungry or more afraid of, of, of uh, not being able to become a filmmaker. So I was, you know, uh, shooting one thing after the next and so on. So with the success of Lucia, uh, it was easy to shoot Chronic to find the money and Tim sign in and everything uh, we talked about. But also uh, financing became a, a little bit easier for a limited extent of time. Then it was complicated again. <laughs> but I used that window uh, to, to, to uh, produce with these friends. I, I'm not a producer that will read scripts. I never read scripts that are sent by someone I don't know because shooting a, a, a film with someone, it's, it's, it's a very intimate process. So I only do it with close friends. And my role as a producer is just what they do when they produce for me. I help them out to make a better movie. So it's a very horizontal, uh, so to speak, uh, relationship where uh, we, we, we depart from the fact that the director is always right and has the last word. So we do whatever he needs. With David Sonan, it was uh, slightly different, of course, because uh, he's way younger than I, and he was my assistant for years. So it, it's a different thing. But again, with David, I was never on set. Uh, I visited, you know, I told him, this is your movie, so good luck. And I'm here if you need me. And I gave him a many, many notes on, on the script and, and many more on the editing. And he would reshoot things up after our chats. So I would kind of guide him. But uh, it's, you know, uh, I, I'm, uh, not many producers truly believe in the fact that uh, film is a director's uh, media and, and not, there's, it's, it's not show business or any bullshit like that. And it's not about all your previous experience. It's about understanding what every movie needs uh, particularly. So you cannot impose a production system into a movie and you cannot uh, force a director into anything he doesn't believe in. And what's next, Michelle? What comes after New Order for you? I got something, but I won't tell you what it is. Well, then we'll have to invite you back to the London Film Festival so you can show it to <laughs> us and, and tell us about it next time. Michelle Franco, that, thank you so very, very much. Thank you so much. And, and I'm glad that uh, people will be entertained by, by our chat and, and hopefully they will watch the movies they haven't seen of, of my work. Thank you so much. See you next year.